Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello, and welcome to All Things Policy. I'm your host, Shri Krishna Upadhyaya. And my guest today on the show is Jonathan Maskell. He's a senior program officer at the Identification for Development, which is a World Bank initiative. My other guest on the show today is Ritul Gaur, who's an IIC fellow working at the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. Uh, welcome, Jonathan. Welcome, Ritul, on the show. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. Uh, so, Jonathan, let's begin the conversation today about digital IDs with a very simple question posed to you. What is the problem with identification in the world today that you're looking to solve? And how do digital IDs fit into the picture? So, the World Bank is a development institution, and we became interested in this topic um, a few years ago because increasingly, being able to prove who you are is a requirement or the absence of being able to prove who you are is a barrier for accessing services and economic opportunities, whether that is opening a bank account, applying for credit, enrolling children in school, becoming a member of health insurance program, or even formal employment. Now, the challenge is that we've just published uh, data in the past uh, couple of months that shows there is 850 million people around the world who lack any form of official identification. The majority, just over half, are in sub-Saharan Africa, around 470 million, and a quarter, 200 million, are in South Asia. But the problem doesn't stop there. So there are these people who absolutely have no ID, and then there are people who may have some form of identification, but it's not very useful in today's digital age. For example, it's a piece of paper, the ID card may be a piece of paper that cannot be verified, it's easily forged and thus not trustworthy. It could be that it doesn't respect uh, privacy. It could be that the system that underpins it is not able to be used by service providers in order to innovate how they deliver those. So apart from it being a coverage and completeness issue, it's also an issue of utilization and quality. How do we improve the quality of these ID systems? And there's various estimates how many people lack a quote-unquote good ID. McKinsey Global Institute attempted this um, a few years ago, and they found on top of the people without an official ID, there's about 3.7 billion without an ID that is fit for purpose in the digital age. So those are the problems that we're trying to solve. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you, Sri. I just want to start with the fact that Jonathan has been helping us with framing digital ID as digital public infrastructure for our G20 efforts. And he's been really kind to give us all his time and sort of all the concepts that we've understood. Jonathan, I want to quickly sort of ask you two questions. One being slightly more provocative that why do you think we are talking about digital IDs in 2023? I mean, even with the fact that digitalization has been going on for a good 30 years, were we, what were the kind of problems apart from the fact that so many people don't have identities, which is more of a developing world problem? What is the problem that necessitates the need for a digital ID and two is what is this new approach are we are we saying that we are looking at digital ID as a digital public infrastructure is it a global movement or is it just selected few countries who've sort of initiated it and is now being sort of opened up for the world I mean we we know about India's Aadhaar or Philippines Philsys so could you expand on both these things and then perhaps we can move to what kind of projects ID4D is supporting? What is the approach that ID4D has taken? Thanks, Ritul. So on your first question, I would kind of challenge the notion that this is a developing world issue. I come from Australia, a high income country, and we have our own problems with identification. For example, indigenous populations have lower rates of birth registration coverage, and we still struggle today as a country to establish a digital ID system that would allow uh, citizens and residents to access services online, although there's a lot of uh, progress being made. So this goes to the heart of the premise of your question, which is why are we still talking about this uh, in 2023? I like to draw back to a case study that we did on the, the ID system in, in South Korea. Their storyline is very interesting. So when, after the Korean War, they established a, a resident registration system, that's what they call it, to number one, sort out who is from South Korea, who is from North Korea, who is male and eligible to be conscripted, and where people live so that they can 
allocate the population across the country and manage the internal migration. So this is the 50s and 60s after the, the Korean War. So in other words, it was a system of administration or a system even of control. Then as South Korea developed, and it's a, you know, obviously a digital leader in many respects, they shifted their mindset to identity being a tool of empowerment, right? So something that's not necessarily about the state having power or control, but more about unlocking both innovation by service providers, and second of all, to give people a little bit more or maybe a lot more control over their personal data. So this evolution naturally happens as, as countries uh, develop and digitalize. And the thing is about ID system is that they really, these are often the most complex projects a country can do because number one, it's the only project that literally touches every single person in the country. A census will only do a questionnaire for the head of household. A voter registration or an election only touches adults. It's the only type of project that literally touches everybody. Second, it obviously touches upon a lot of social, cultural, and political issues. Issues around nationality and citizenship, quite politically sensitive and complex because of historical reasons, because of discrimination, etc. And then you throw in some of the most advanced, complex technologies that countries that often haven't applied these technologies before have to learn, you know, what are good practices? How do we ensure privacy? How do we reduce the risk of lock-in? And there's often quite a knowledge asymmetry between the governments who implement these systems and the providers of these technologies. But this is changing now through the growth of digital public goods, including open source software and open standards that are really addressing that. So every country goes through this evolution of ID systems from administration and control to being an enabling platform for empowerment and for service delivery, but obviously at different paces. And then you've got to take into account that every country will have a different approach. So ADHA in India is a centralized system that's based on biometrics. In Australia, in the UK, Canada, the United States, such a model would probably, in the current context, will probably not be supported by the public and would be quite difficult to advance politically. Um, instead, these countries are going with federated or even decentralized models, and this reflects the political structures and the socio-cultural context of, of those. And then I think the final thing I would add about your first part of your question is that the COVID-19 pandemic and the impacts of that in terms of lockdowns, in terms of things moving online, really highlighted the importance of digitalization and the availability of digital services. When what we've seen in a number of countries is because of the pandemic, they accelerated the rollout of their digital ID systems. So in the Philippines, for example, in Australia, it grew in, in Singapore, they went from a fraction of the population using SingPass, the digital ID, to more than 90% of the eligible population. And so this demand from citizens or access to online services, which requires a digital ID, is another driving factor in this. Then on the issue of ID as a digital public infrastructure, this is certainly a paradigm shift and it's aligned with what I mentioned earlier about this evolution from administration to empowerment. But with the added dimension of the linkages between digital ID systems and other digital platforms, so for example, digital payments and data sharing, um, and it's certainly something that India has pioneered through the India stack and has shown, you know, the powerful impact, not just for efficiency of service delivery and public administration, but also really genuinely improving the lives of citizens and residents. Um, the linkages, for example, can be as simple as uh, using an ID for payments. I recently had to do a remittance of a payment from Singapore, where I reside, to India. And it literally took about half an hour to collect all the information that was needed to make that payment. The IFSC code, the bank branch, the address, all this information, it was quite substantial. And then when I asked the person I was sending the money to, is this how it used to be in India before UPI? And he said, yes. And so I, I really understood you know, the power of fast payments that, that leverage a digital ID or as a proxy address like UPI or prompt pay in Thailand or pay now in Singapore. All I need is an ID number or a phone number or some other unique identifier, and then the payment can be easily made. The other one when it comes to data sharing, so increasingly as we access more services online, 
the issue of consent and on the data that we're providing, but also that is being verified after we provide it is very important. And a digital ID, a well-designed one, can help facilitate that consent. So when I, for example, in Singapore, apply for a bank account um, or a credit card, I can do this completely online using my SingPass digital ID. They have a service called MyInfo that once I verify myself with SingPass, I can then authorize the government to share relevant information, tax returns, property ownership, my address, my citizenship, etc., with the financial service provider. The financial service provider has the benefit. They don't have to do any additional verification because it comes from the source directly. And I have the benefit of not having to provide that information manually because it, it comes automatically from the source. Right. I actually did something very similar last night. Like I used the DigiLocker service, which is a digital wallet for storing all your ID documents released by the government of India. I used DigiLocker services to apply for a credit card. And in ours, I got a confirmation saying that, you know, subject to verification of your documents, your application is approved. So yeah, definitely it's a game changer as far as financial services are concerned. But Jonathan, you said a lot of interesting things. So I want to sort of double click on a few of them. Uh, the first question is about biometrics, right? Uh, so like you rightly mentioned, need not be the only form of unique identification. But if not, how do you create a system of unique ID, which is trustworthy, which is credible, verifiable and can be authenticated or uh, without the use of biometrics? Because uh, folks in India haven't really thought about it. We just directly went to biometrics. That's my first question. And my second question to you is about at the outset, I think it's important to address a couple of issues which you also touched upon one is that identification is a touchy issue it's sensitive in india there are discussions about how identification is necessary to prove your citizenship and so on so the stakes are really high and also a connected issue is of uh, denial of service right which i think you also mentioned that i mean we should move from the principle that nobody can be denied any essential service only because of failure to identify in a particular manner. So about these two issues, right, about uh, ensuring that no person who is eligible to a particular service or a benefit is denied that particular service, how does ID40 look at these issues? That's my question. To you. Very good question. So on biometrics, indeed, as you said, this is a sensitive issue because the stakes and the risks are very high. The use of biometrics has two purposes. One is deduplication, so establishing uniqueness, like you said. The other is secure verification, right? And if, I think it's very important when discussing biometrics to, to be very nuanced about when it comes to uniqueness, high-income countries that have had decades or centuries of uh, very good birth and death records, their civil registries, they can generally uh, use this demographic information for uniqueness, right? So, for example, in Australia, we do not have a unique ID like uh, an Adha number. And in fact, for example, New Zealand, their privacy commission explicitly bans the use of a unique identifier that's issued for one purpose to be used for any other purpose because it's a privacy. It invokes some concerns about privacy and unwarranted or unauthorized correlation of data. So, with these demographic records, name, date of birth, where you're born perhaps, it's fairly straightforward to establish uniqueness. But then, you know, you've got to take into account that this approach will not work in every country. Uh, for uh, countries the size in terms of population of, let's say, India, China, Indonesia, etc., it can be quite difficult because there's a lot of common names. In Vietnam, for example, I think about 30 to 40% of the population have the surname Nguyen. Likewise, in Korea, there's very common surnames. In the Philippines, People are often named after the, the patron saint of the feast day that they were born on, or those two. So in other words, people often have the same names um, who were born on the same day. And developing countries often, unfortunately, do not have reliable birth and death records. It's a major issue. More than half of the 850 million people without an official ID are actually children who haven't had their birth registered. And thus, biometrics could be and is often a very good way to address what we call the stock problem. The population today, how do you establish uniqueness, right? And when you have sufficient legal and technological controls over this, it can be effective and it can be a safe way to establish a uniqueness. But it's also important to note that it's not a perfect technology. There's going to be issues with it. And therefore, as id for d we take an approach that there needs to be safeguards to prevent exclusion. For example, 
if a pharma cannot provide fingerprints and that's your only modality for biometric deduplication, then you need to have manual methods of, of registering that person. Likewise, if the, the technology is not performing well and is finding a lot of duplicates, etc., you need to have the systems and processes in place to deal with those uh, the adjudication of these cases in a very efficient way. You don't want cases pending for months or years, which means that the person is waiting for an ID and thus is be, could be being denied services. So that's on uniqueness. Then authentication. Authentication, again, is a very important use case for biometrics because unlike, for example, if I show my birth certificate, it says Jonathan Marskell, born in New South Wales, Australia, I could give that to you and you could pretend to be me. There's no way to link that identity information uh, with the physical person that is accessing the service. Biometrics can do that. Now, what we've also seen is that it actually has some positive outcomes. We've done a, an impact evaluation in Pakistan where um, as part of the Benazir Income Support Program, or BISP, they deliver a cash payment to the female head of household. And previously, the money would be withdrawn with a pin code. And what would unfortunately often happen is that the husband, the father, the brother, the uncle, or whoever would take the, um, take the money using the PIN code because obviously the, the woman head of household could uh, just give that PIN code. Um, but then when biometrics were introduced to ensure that it was indeed the woman who would be picking up money for the ATM, what we saw was a relatively significant increase in household spending on, on healthcare and education for children. Right, And so by guaranteeing that the right person is receiving the benefit, this has a positive outcome. Now, that's not to say that this is, a, again, a perfect approach. And like I said earlier, it's not a perfect technology. Um, it can fail, especially fingerprints. Um, so it's very important as ID4D, we, we strongly advocate, number one, not to use biometrics for everything. For low-risk transactions, it may not be needed. In fact, it's likely not going to be needed. It may be as simple as just showing your, your ID card. In fact, I've heard that, for example, in India, the vast majority of Aadhaar transactions are actually someone just showing their Aadhaar card, not necessarily a biometrication. And we see this across every single country. Um, second is to have exception handling mechanisms. So if the biometric technology doesn't work, you should have a ready-made alternative available. For example, you let the person access the service or pick up the benefit, and then you can validate it separately later. You know, perhaps when if the system's back and up and running, you can synchronize uh, the authentication request, or you can have some other way to verify that, that the right person received the benefit. So with all these safeguards in place, you can get the benefits of using biometrics whilst uh, reducing the risks, particularly of exclusion. So I wanted to ask you more about digital public goods. Taratul, if you want to go ahead, please. Yeah. Yeah, perhaps I can jump in. Also, Shri, the person Jonathan was trying to send money in India was me. <laughs> so he was quite shocked that we had to do that. We had to like how money transfer was such a difficult task back in the day without UPI. <laughs> so uh, quickly um, touching the rage and uh, the very hot topic of the day, which is digital public infrastructure. And uh, as I understand, Jonathan, DPIs represent a new approach of creating these open modular interoperable solutions, digital architecture, which can be used by government business citizens to create solutions atop, which can then innovate further. And this is also a tectonic shift from the siloed context specific approach of problem solving. This is, this is a rather more of whole of society approach involving diverse stakeholders. And a key component of it is there are two key components to this. One is the building blocks approach, which is reusable, repurposable solutions. And the second is the digital public good aspect of it. Can you expand on these two themes of what are these reusable, repurposable solutions and what are these digital public goods which are being used to create these digital ID projects and what is particularly being used at World Bank's ID for D? And in fact, I think it would be important for the listeners to understand where does World Bank come in? Like at what level, what kind of work does ID for D? Is it training assistance, capacity building to these government organizations or is it actually implementing and giving people their registration, their central registration, their, their ID cards, etc. And one more question, which I think we've asked you multiple times is the pinpoint of all of it. What do you think, Jonathan, that is 
आर आईडी क्रिएटेड बाय ओनली पब्लिक एंटिटीज और देर आर प्राइवेट एंटिटीज ऑल्सो सर्विंग दिस पर्पज एंड क्रिएटिंग आईडीज विच आर एक्सेप्टेबल विच आर इंटरऑपरेबल एक्सेट्रा ओके सो ऑन योर फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन ऑफ बिल्डिंग ब्लॉक्स एंड एंड डिजिटल पब्लिक गुड्स सो इन डी दिस इज I mean, well, number one, I'm going to say from the outset as World Bank and ID for D, we're approach and technology agnostic, right? So when we work with countries or, or when we produce uh, knowledge resources, uh, we do not advocate a particular approach because, as I mentioned earlier, every country is going to be very different and have a very different solution in mind. Whether it's a centralized versus federated, whether it's a proprietary versus open source solution, uh, the type of data that's collected, etc. So I don't necessarily see uh, the building blocks and and digital public goods approaches as uh, contradictory. In fact, they could in many ways be uh, mutually reinforcing. And um, I think you know when we talk about building blocks, this is about having clarity of what is the role of of different parts of the ecosystem and specifying the functions and the standards and the interfaces in terms of how these work together. This is what GovStack initiative is doing. For a whole digital government, this is what G2P Connect is doing for the specific uh, use cases of government payments, and I think this is very valuable because we see time and time again. I'll say also that as ID for D, we're working in approximately 50 countries, and sister initiative, which is government person digitizing government person payments, uh, it's called G2P X. They're working in around 40 countries, and with some overlap between the 50 and the 40. Is that this issue of because like the the ecosystem, whatever the use case is, it requires collaboration across multiple agencies and multiple systems. And one of the biggest challenges we see time and time again, and this is not just in developing countries, we also observe this in developed high income countries, is vendor lock in. When a government will purchase a turnkey solution, let's say, and they can't make many changes to the system, whether it's as simple as adding a data field. Or if it's adding an API to interface, communicate with other systems, either they can't do it, they have to pay enormous change request fees in order to do it. And so, having these specifications and good examples available in the public domain is very useful for helping countries as they design these systems, as they procure or build these systems. Then, when we come to digital public goods, I mean, there's a broad definition of DPGs, which is that it's open source software, open standards, open data, open API models. There are a whole range of open technologies, but in reality, you know, it's predominantly open source software. Now, to be very clear, open source software has a lot of advantages, but it also comes with a lot of risks. Uh, in many cases, those advantages are, are very strong, and we see a lot of growing demand from countries, particularly when it comes to ID systems, to explore the use of DPGs. There is the modular open source identity platform, MoSIP, which has been adopted by Morocco, the Philippines, Togo, Sri Lanka, Guinea, uh, Ethiopia, and a few other countries. Where this, you know, MoSIP is a very powerful example of a DPG because. It draws heavily, but not exclusively, on the the great success of Adhub and brings in other good practices from other countries. And so the code base is freely available for countries to use, and countries get additional technical support from the MoSIP team, which is housed at Triple ITB, the International IT International Institute for IT Bangalore, um, to make sure that they do this well. And what I've found in my experience working in a number of countries that are currently using MoSIP, considering、uh, MoSIP as a digital public good,、um, power of this is not just the fact that they are、uh, using software that is cutting edge. It's also the fact that they have greater visibility on the technology. What do I mean by this? So, in the Philippines, for example, when they started using MoSIP, I think it was in 2019, if I'm not mistaken. I went to the implementing agency, the Philippine Statistics Authority, and I saw a room with about ten young software developers who were working on the project, going through the GitHub, going through the code, and it was really exciting for me to see these people soaking up, you know, this knowledge that they had free access to, and learning about how this technology works, but also looking at different approaches to developing code. And then you look at the documentation that is available. For instance,、uh, the API specifications, all the different standards, how to configure the system, etc. Having this information available is really, really powerful. And I know of many more countries who are not adopting MoSIP, 
but are using all this knowledge that's in the public domain to build their capacity. And so there is this great positive effect of these digital public goods. But like I said, you know, these digital public goods are not the solution in every country. So that what we've seen as well is that countries need a lot of capacity to manage these projects properly because, of course, they can hire a systems integrator to, to do this or they can build it in-house, but it requires a lot more capacity in terms of project management, for instance, or if there's a systems integrator in terms of vendor and contract management. And so if those expertise or capacity are not available locally, often it might be better to have a well-designed proprietary solution. And there are other advantages to having proprietary or bespoke solutions. I mean, Adhar is itself a DPG. It's a, it was built bespoke. Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, South Africa, these are all systems that were built in-house uh, that are some of the best ID systems in the world. So they're just to highlight that there are different approaches to this. And then on your question about how the World Bank and ID4D work. So first of all, ID4D is a cross-sectoral initiative. We comprise of various global practices within the World Bank. So uh, digital development, social protection and jobs, health, governance, finance, competitiveness and innovation, our social sustainability and inclusion as well. And then other parts of the World Bank group, including IFC and, and CGAP. And we act as a bit of a horizontal, because ID is such a horizontal foundational issue. You can have the you know individual health ID, social protection ID, taxation ID systems, but quite often these can be duplicate, fragmented investments systems, and they cause more problems. And hence, our role as ID for D is, is to work with our sectoral teams to see how countries can have a more holistic approach to solving their identity issues. We also, that's our country uh, work pillar. Second is our knowledge pillar for leadership. So the 850 million figure I mentioned earlier is, is one of our flagship uh, analytical work streams, but we publish a lot of resources in practitioner's guide that really is a comprehensive how to design an ID system. We go into specific issues like on biometrics. We have a biometrics primer, a civil society guidance note, enrollment strategies paper, and we do country case studies. We recently published an excellent one on Singapore's uh, digital ID. We've done others on Argentina, South Africa, Moldova. And then the third pillar is, is the global platforms. We have convened a lot of organizations, I think it's 30 now, to develop 10 principles on identification for sustainable development. Um, which, um, you know, it's no coincidence that there's 10 commandments and 10 principles on ID for sustainable development. These really provide a guiding normative framework for countries, and it's a very useful advocacy tool. We also have a high-level advisory council and participation in various digital public goods initiatives. We contribute to MOSIP, to OpenCRVS, and others. But coming back to how we work at the country level, so the World Bank has a variety of ways to do this. First is our traditional uh, project uh, financing uh, instruments. So we would provide financing for a government to implement an ID system. This is money that they would spend themselves, but we would provide uh, supervision, fiduciary support, and technical assistance along the way. Second is development policy lending. So this is where we uh, work with countries on a set of institutional reforms, let's say passing new legislation on data protection and that we would then provide a general budget support for. The third is technical assistance. This is a lot of what ID4D does, uh, the ID4D team, I mean. We provide uh, capacity building. We work with governments on supporting them to develop their roadmaps, strategies, technical designs. I would highlight some work that we've done, for example, in Rwanda, where we did some end user research. The report is on our website looking at the kinds of challenges people face accessing IDs and particularly birth registration. you know, And then we also engage with other stakeholders at the national level, such as academia, the private sector, and civil society, leveraging our convening power. Then in terms of your question on the role of the private sector, so as I mentioned earlier, every country will have a different way of approaching identity issues. Now, you can have a fully public sector, developed, funded, managed, implemented system, uh, which is your traditional national ID. But those federated or decentralized approaches that I mentioned is where rather than the state being an implementer of such a system, it may just be a regulator of such a system. There's a few examples of this. That recently, the UK 
stop this system, but the UK Verify system had, I think, five private sector identity providers. In France, you have France Connect. Uh, there's a few uh, private sector providers that, that participate in that. Uh, in Australia, well, trusted digital identity framework that would be licensing um, uh, private sector ID providers. And I believe there's similar efforts in, in Canada. And how this works is very similar to, for example, when you sign into, when you download a new app on your smartphone and it asks you to create an account, you have the option to provide your email address and then create a password, or you can sign in using your Google account, Yahoo account, LinkedIn account, etc. That's a federation. So if I would be accessing a service online, I would be taken to a page that says, who is your identity provider? And someone would say, okay, my identity provider is Bank A. And then it would take me to Bank A to verify myself. And then it would take me back to the service that I was using. But when Bank A created my identity, it would still be based on official sources of information. So it could be my passport, my driving license, or my birth record. So it still has the trust of being based on my legal identity, uh, but the actual authentication process is managed by the private sector partner. Now, there have been some questions I've seen. There's a very a good thinker I, um, called Steve Wilson. He's also a compatriot of mine who has analyzed whether this is a commercially viable approach. And considering that these approaches um, have not necessarily been widely adopted, uh, at least yet, you know, there is some merit to, to argue that the commercialization of this is of these approaches is limited. But then we see these decentralized models emerging where the private sector would be uh, maintaining a, a digital wallet application that you could store official and, and other credentials into. Um, it'll be very interesting to see how these business models emerge. We are following it very closely to see how this is relevant for developing countries. But the reality is that the, the state will still always have a very significant role to play, either as an implementer and or as a regulator. Right. So thanks for that, Jonathan. So all that you said is really fascinating to me. And the fact that, uh, you know, a national digital ID project is so complicated and involves so many different stakeholders. But at the same time, if done right, it provides us with so many opportunities, both in the government and in the private sector. So you mentioned principles on identification for sustainable development, right? And we have been talking about digital public goods. I think these principles are also talking about open standards and preventing vendor and tech lock-in. Uh, so when a World Bank is uh, sponsoring any project, how does that that happen in the sense are you mandating countries to follow these principles is there a requirement on any country or uh, receiving funds to implement open standards from the beginning or is it more of a principle there and that's a loose requirement and the other thing is uh, something which i found while uh, researching for this podcast was id enabling environment assessment that you guys do before partnering with any country and uh, from what i understood this is like a due diligence exercise where you do an assessment of the country's existing ID systems to look at uh, it in a very holistic manner. So could you elaborate a little bit more on this, please? Very good question. Yes. So thank you for mentioning the ID enabling environment assessment or IDEA for short. It's one of the three main diagnostic tools that we use uh, when we engage with countries and support them. The first is the ID for the diagnostic, which is a general overview. So, and the IDEA is it goes deep into the legal and regulatory environment. The third is the qualitative uh, research tool. So we actually do uh, surveys or focus group discussions with um, the people, especially vulnerable populations who would be the beneficiaries of, of these ID systems. Um, the, the ID enabling environment assessments are, are very useful reports to, because they don't just look at the ID law, they look at all the other legislation and regulations that uh, sit around that. For example, in the Philippines, we identified all these different regulations that have requirements for some form of identification. And we found, for example, some specifically mentioned that in order to do access this service, someone needs to present an ID that has a signature on it, right? Um, which is a bit of an outdated requirement. And these regulations were from decades ago. But it's important to, to analyze the interface between the ID system itself and all the different e the parts of the ecosystem around that, especially because the legal frameworks are a very important aspect of, of an ID system because, and it's not just the, the law itself, but the process in developing the law. So consultations and having a transfer process is very important. I'm very proud of being part of a project in, a, in Samoa, a small country in the Pacific, 
where our project, our small connectivity project, supported the government to develop draft legislation. And they literally went to every single community, every village in the country to raise their awareness and gather feedback on the bill, which is a very effective way for getting community support for this legislation. Thank you for the comprehensive understanding um, explanation, Jonathan. Just last two questions from my end. One being that how do we take into account the risks that pertains with these kind of systems. I know a bunch of countries have outrightly said that they don't want a unique identifier. Example, New Zealand, most of the Western European countries are also averse to to unique identifiers and are centralized database countries. So I just want to understand that the one way to go about it is that these identity system in itself are uh, they have a privacy by design principle, which is what I, ID for the sustainable rules say. Or two could be that the project itself have has a legislation of its own, similar to, to the Aadhaar Act. Or it could be like a broad framework or a broad overarching regulation, which is of something of a privacy act, could be a GDPIR, etc. So what is the global landscape of how do we sort of secure these programs or how do we manage the risks with it? And the final could be that how do you see the future innovations happening in this? Are we moving towards mobile only IDs because Aadhaar was, is just a number? We don't even have a card anymore. So are we only moving to mobile only IDs or uh, is there FRT coming, facial recognition tech coming in? So what are the kind of innovations that are coming or sort of uh, could be expected in future in this ID landscape? Very good. So in terms of the issue of personal data protection, generally speaking, we believe it's important for, for countries to, to have these in place and applying to, to ID systems, but not exclusively across the economy and society. Because the risks of privacy, I mean, ID is often a lightning rod issue for uh, concerns about privacy, and rightfully so. But then you have, you know, health, social protection, finance. These are all, you know, sectors that are that are handling uh, equally and sometimes even more sensitive information about people. So we provide support to countries for the development of their data protection legal frameworks. In Nigeria, for example, our project in Nigeria has supported the government to develop a draft bill that will hopefully uh, be passed soon. Um, We also work with countries to incorporate uh, personal data protection measures into their ID legislation specifically, right? Now, as I mentioned earlier, every country is going to be very different and the risks are assessed accordingly. So we don't have a one-size-fits-all approach. We assess everything in a country before you know, uh, providing our recommendations and and analysis and uh, proposing risk mitigation measures. I also think it's important to highlight the cybersecurity and information security aspect. Often data protection and security issues are intertwined, but at the same time, you know, there's some very important work that needs to be done to improve capacity and understanding on information and cybersecurity issues. For example, ID systems should be considered as critical information infrastructure within the whatever cybersecurity policies and strategies are in place in every country. Countries need to understand what are the important infosec measures to incorporate into the system, even basic things like multi-factor authentication for the registration offices, encryption across the board, those kind of things in terms of how you design the systems you mentioned privacy by design as well. There's a lot of measures like tokenization identifier that will help reduce those risks around a unique identifier. So we work with countries to identify and adopt those uh, those solutions in every context. Now, the in terms of innovations and what we see as trends, so I think you mentioned mobile ID. Absolutely. This is something that we see a lot of demand for from our countries. I think the reality is so there's been a bit of an evolution in technology. So the first IDs were a simple piece of paper. Maybe then they start to be laminated then they start to be plastic and people put microchips into them. But now smartphone applications are the natural evolution from those smart cards. The beauty of the smartphone applications are that is, well, there, there's several. So first is that the growing uh, penetration of smartphones, it's very, it's growing quite fast. 
Um, of course, it's it's not a hundred percent. When a country approaches us to support them to develop a mobile ID, we always emphasize that this is not a solution that will cover everyone in the country, and therefore you still need to maintain physical cards and other mechanisms um, so that everyone uh, can use their ID. Second is it provides a lot more flexibility because it's software based. So you could push security updates, you can push feature updates to new versions, have new versions of the, the ID and and push those updates and, and those can be easily downloaded. Third is, this is one of the many things I love about Singapore's uh, SingPass app. So they've seen a high, a fast increase in scams, including in relation to the use of the SingPass app and they can push messages. Uh, so when I open the app, I get a reminder, things to look out for the scams. And I was just talking to a country recently that was thinking about putting a game inside their digital ID app to build the user's awareness on privacy so that, um, you know, because often people highlight that digital literacy is one of the risks to privacy. I completely agree with that. You know, the, there's these innovative things that you can do the moment software-based uh, form factor, such as a mobile ID. Then finally, it adds a lot more security. Increasingly, the biometric matching is done on device. So just like you unlock your phone, that can be the secure way of authenticating on the device. And so there is not sending the biometrics or other information to the central database in order to uh, do the verification. If it can be done in a trusted way on device, then that addresses scalability issues, it addresses privacy issues, and it can unlock a lot of innovation. The second trend I would say is this verifiable credential. This is really about decentralized identity or user control of identity. This is where the credentials are generated from an authoritative source, but the authentication is done against the credential rather than against the database. So what does this mean? For example, a vaccine certificate. I'm issued a vaccine certificate. It may come in, in the form of a QR code. And in order to verify that, the public key to do the verification may be sourced inside that QR code or on a decentralized, and it doesn't necessarily need to be blockchain, but a decentralized trust registry, right? So this addresses the issue of, because the concerns about a centralized database is not just about the aggregation of information and the honeypot effect, but it's also that the central authority can see what transactions are being done, right? So they can see that Jonathan went to this bank and then the next day went to that bank and that kind of thing. The moment you decentralize this, you reduce that privacy and surveillance risk. Um, the EU is, is developing a new regulation uh, for digital wallets um, that will be applying this verifiable credentials. We're very excited to see how that turns out. Um, it'll be the first, uh, you know, large-scale implementation. So, so we'll have to see how this plays out. Um, but we're following it closely. Wow! Yeah, uh, I mean, to come to think of it, I think uh, ID cards fall into this long list of items that mobile phones have actually killed, starting from your alarm clocks to you know, your ATM machines. And I'm actually very curious about uh, what you said on verifiable credentials. Uh, because I think that can potentially address a lot of surveillance concerns also that uh, people tend to have with digital ID and digital systems. But we'll have to pause for today and maybe we can take it up some other time. But uh, thanks a lot, Jonathan, for joining us on this conversation today. We had a lot to take away from this and we are definitely looking at more of what ID4D does in the future. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me anytime. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, Shri, for hosting this. And uh, I'll make sure, Shri, if Jonathan is in Bangalore and we're in Bangalore, I'll get him to office. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, please. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in.